from the files of Dr. Mack, hosted by J.J. McCollister. The heritage portion of interests, Blacks in the Bible, her story, includes women in the Bible, prominent issues which can be handled with biblical Christian counseling, as well as comments regarding current media content regarding women. And now, Dr. Mack. Hello. Well, today is March 13th, 2024, and welcome to the second podcast from the file, from the biblical files of Dr. Mack. Well, today we're going to continue the conversation we started regarding blacks in the Bible, black figures in the Bible. And as we spoke last week, I told you we would go ahead and take a look at Nimrod, which makes me pretty excited because he is one of the most controversial persons to to research. Page after page after page. Ancient civilization after ancient civilization after ancient civilization. But we get our start in the Bible where we start everything that we're going to do. In addition to Nimrod, we want to take a look at his wife, Samaritus, if if time permits. I had also scheduled something on Abraham and Hagar, but we'll preview that for next week. But we will have our segments on recent scholarship as well as news uh, that it will be of interest to you. So let's go ahead and get started with Nimrod. Well, last week we told you that Nimrod... Uh, is a biblical figure, and some people say, well, he's a minor biblical figure. No, for me, especially since we're talking black, black persons in the Bible, we need to take a look at this warrior, warrior king, descendant of Noah. So throughout biblical history, certain figures stand out as powerful or enigmatic, and their stories continue to captivate us and cause us to research and research and research. And the only thing that we've got going regarding Nimrod is the fact that, hey, he was a mighty hunter and a powerful king. And we learned that in Genesis, which is our first book in the Christian Bible. However, to make a complete portrait of him, we'll have to do what uh, scholars refer to as extra biblical research. And we will try to stay pretty close to um, the Jewish version. However, we must remember that this particular gentleman crosses all religions, different names, same character. So uh, one of the most memorable things about him is the claim that he married Samaritus, a woman from ancient Babylon, and who is referred to in the Bible by certain names, um, and in not a very generous manner. Many claim that uh, Nimrod's mother is uh, the same as the wife, but Dr. Mack discovered that there could be and is probably uh, some misinterpretations going on there. But it goes much deeper than, than meets the eye. So what do we know about Nimrod? Who was he? Well, first of all, we see that there, that, um, the source for this is established in the Bible, as said previously. He is one of the Bible's well-known figures. He appears only three times in the Bible, but there are really five references, and actually there are some supplemental references when we get over to talk about Samaritans. And the most important information about him, as we said last week, was found in Genesis 10th chapter, verses 8 through 12. Now, again, we have to remember when we when we interpret things, sometimes they come out differently, especially when we're going back into antiquity. And when we do that, it can complicate matters. And that is one of the things that happens with Nimrod. But to get started, let's go to his family tree. The uh, primary interpretive issue is the... Uh, the fact that he is a descendant of Noah, and our time setting for him comes after the great flood that's recorded in Genesis 6 through 8. Uh, Nimrod's family 
was the only family that survived, if we take a look, in Genesis. In Genesis 10, uh, verse 8, it states that Cush, Nimrod's grandson, by way of Ham, fathered Nimrod, making Nimrod the great-grandson of Noah. However, Genesis 10 and 7 lists off the sons of Cush, and guess what? Nimrod's not listed. He is in the next verse, but not in that particular verse. So this has led many to speculate that he was not the son of Cush, which is the beginning of our frustration, but more a distant uh, related descendant. It's also possible that Nimrod was not listed in verse 7 because he is what? Single out in verse 8. While the Bible does not explicitly name Nimrod's mother, some traditions and interpretations might refer to her as just the mother of Nimrod, adding another layer of speculation and exploration. Let's talk about his character. Now, one of the things when I talk about character, I'm talking about not necessarily what he said, because we don't have a lot of quotes. It's what he did, what others said about him, how he reacted to the situation. So let's talk about his character. And this is where we get really interested in the young, oh, we're not really sure it was young, the mighty hunter, you know, because here we have a direct quote, because God gave him a gift which made him an exquisite hunter. If we look at Genesis 10, chapter 9 through 12, verse, Nimrod is described as a mighty hunter before the Lord and a mighty warrior on the earth. Now, these descriptors not only portray him uh, as being a skillful hunter, but also highlight that he was probably a ruler. That term we're going to be using today, that extra biblical tradition, links Nimrod to the ruler who commissioned the Tower of Babel, an account which is recorded in Genesis 11. This association paints Nimrod as a, in a different light, not as one who is serving God, but one who is challenging God, which comes to the translation of his name, which means to rebel or to be a, a, a rebel. So it paints him in a different light as a man who was defiant against God and eager to make a name for himself. One of the things that keeps coming up as, as you research Nimrod is that he was interested in having a name to be known, to be that particular leader. So as we conjure this and we go through and read more and more, we find out that um, the interpretation um, is going to change the way we look at him. But the one thing that we have to remember, we are discussing blacks in the Bible. And it doesn't matter how this extra biblical tradition links him, um, we know that he was a descendant of Ham. Therefore, he is a, a black person. So let's look at Nimrod in the ancient world. And we have to be careful as we go through it. So we know that <clears throat> he uh, existed in the, in the Near Eastern uh, region of the, the known world at that time and that he is synonymous with not only being a hunter, but he was a great builder. And I also like this phrase that he was not only that hunter of animals, but he was also a hunter of men. Because we'll see when we get to that tower building situation, these people were not coerced into doing it. He, he didn't have to force them into doing it. It doesn't read that way. However, they did this thing, which was not in the sight of God. So we're talking about the civilization, including Assyria, which is often called the land of Nimrod in um, Micah 5th chapter 6 verse. And we are talking about the other city, Babylon, uh, which became an iconic symbol of human achievement at that time. And it was that it was there that a lot of the activity occurs in the Bible. So ancient traditions and texts celebrate Nimrod as being mighty warrior and the founder of Babylon and Nineveh. 
and we when you start talking about either one of those biblical characters just jump out at you it, going all the way to Jonah or Ezekiel or especially Jeremiah um so these are these are you know this these cities become very important and they consider Nimrod many people consider him and give him credit for starting the world's first empire it's interesting to know that there was no quote unquote king at that point uh prior to Nimrod. But not only does he make himself king, he goes on well he doesn't, but Samaritus later deendifies him and he becomes a god with a little G. A god with a little G. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh it's exciting to read. The imagination can fly depending on the cultures that you're studying at the time. A lot of what we'll talk about today is going to be shrouded in legends and myths, but we'll stay as close as we can to the location. And remember when we're talking about blacks, we're not necessarily saying what our conception of, uh, because the Bible doesn't do colors. It's talking about where you were from, where you descended from. It does those things. So Nimrod, let's just skip right into one of the big things there. Other than the hunter part, he built, he's associated with the building of the Tower of Babel. And they believe that this was a, scholars believe that this was a turning point in the history of mankind, as well as a marvel of engineering and architecture. We're talking about ancient times. We had the structure that went on up into the clouds. So, Theologians have uh, discussed it and described it and uh, imagined its description because it was destroyed, because it wasn't done, uh, because it was uh, sanctioned by God. This is something that was sanctioned by man. Now, the whole project itself <coughs> served as a symbol of human unity and achievement. It's a testament to the ambition of uh, mankind as People sought to elevate themselves to the status of gods. We're talking about little gods. We're also talking about life after the flood. So the story of the building of the Tower of Babel is a cautionary tale in the Bible. It illustrates the consequences of human pride and defiance. God's response to the tower construction was to confuse the languages of those involved, which scattered people across the earth. For some Christians, this story explains the emergence of different languages in human culture. The Tower of Babel narrative highlights the divine intervention in human affairs and the limits of human aspiration. Nimrod's alleged role in this mastermind <coughs> project was his desire for power, unity, and the elevation of his city and the people to unprecedented heights. Now, what we have to remember here is one of the edicts that was given in the Garden of Eden. They were told to go forth and multiply. It was not <clears throat> indicated that they were supposed to cluster in communities, but to go forth throughout the land and multiply. But here we have, at the time of Nimrod, even though we're saying well, it was really great, you built all these cities, but you also have people clustered, you know, <clears throat> and it's doing this this configuration where you get this idea that, oh well, if you have this many people, they're looking to me, so I must be what a king, a power. You know, we have persons today who who want to be dictators. Is the current word that we use. Um, so we had something going on like that with Nimrod. <clears throat> now, what we have is Nimrod as a mighty hunter. We're going to keep referring to that. And when you do it, uh, I always think of uh, someone who's skilled and they're relentless and they're a tracker. So in the ancient world, hunting was a significant activity and it displayed a person's bravery, um, physical abilities, and the dominance over the natural world. Now, we're talking about man against beast, you know, tiger kind of thing, a man against a voracious pig, a kind of thing. There are many who, and there are many statues and 
pictures across ancient um, the ancient world that depict Nimrod walking with a um, um, a, a, a pet uh, leopard, you know, showing that he had mastered uh, the wild animal. But it nowhere in the Bible is it saying that he did that. Um, but we do have the human mankind drawings that did that. It's conceivable that these exploits included um, the wild boars. And these animals were known for their strength and their ferocity. But at the same time, you had Nimrod, a man, a man, and I put it in quotes, who was able to subdue them, especially the wild boar and the the leopard. Now, Mighty Hunter would also be extended to describe the exceptional hunting uh, abilities, which by extension reference Nimrod's strength and leadership qualities. It's possible that the phrase used does not refer to the actual hunting of animals, but rather aims to signify his greatness uh, uh, among the people of that day. Now, one of the things that was very frustrating regarding Nimrod was all the different names that are associated with him. Uh, it's, a, it's some that you know and some that are going to be new to you. Now, Nimrod the Hunter, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, and I know some of you are going to say you've gone entirely too far here, but it's referred to uh, in the Bible, and it has to do with the proudness uh, or his hunting skills. We have Baal in some um, myths and religious tradition. Nimrod is linked with the deity, Baal. And uh, although this association is not found in the Bible, we have Murdoch. And this is in Mesopotamia uh, or Mesopotamian mythology and Babylonian tradition. He is associated with Murdoch, the god of their particular pantheon. He was the father of this particular pantheon. But the one that gets me is Gilgamesh or Gilgamesh um, in the epic, um, the Assyrian epic, the Babylonian epic, uh, because I taught that um, as as, as a new teacher starting out. And one of the phrases I remember even today it's where the character Gilgamesh and Upanishad are traveling, and he said he traveled leagues and leagues in darkness. And for me, the first thing, I think the reason I remember this, because I'm standing in front of this class, and I could see the light come on. He traveled leagues and leagues in darkness. And all of a sudden, I could see students understanding he's confused. Even though he's physically moving forward, he's confused. He's definitely a hero, but he's confused. So. You know, one of the precious memories that I have. But Gilgamesh is associated with him. But we get down to Samaritus. And I know we're moving fast, but we want to make sure we can cover as much of this today. But there is this deeper connection. And it's told in some other texts. And her name is not mentioned in the Bible. For those of you who are saying, well, I'm going to thumb through. I'm going to check my, my phone and see if I can find her. But we encounter of the theories of how he met her. In fact, we don't have mention of a wife for Nim- Nimrod. And again, as we said earlier, the only other woman mentioned is like the mother of Nimrod. But we don't have mention of Samaria as as a wife. But she's a prominent member when we're talking about Nimrod in history or Nimrod in mythology or Nimrod in legend especially Mesopotamian and Babylonian, is well documented. Um, it's something that they can touch because there are ancient texts and there are inscriptions on pieces of sculpture that she was what, a powerful queen of Assyria and Babylon. In fact, she's referred to as the queen of Babylon. And they highlight her accomplishments as a ruler, her military conquests, and her architectural projects. And for me, that founding of the polytheistic religion. So there's a captivating theory. Now, I am working on the concept that she was indeed the wife of Nimrod, and she is, uh, she's uh, talked about in the works called The Two Babylons, 
and that's one of the most notable sources from which the ideas come. And it's important that we examine that evidence. Um, it was published in the 19th century, and it basically is it, trying to take a look at the religious practices as well as those that extended forward till today. Uh, at the heart of the theory lies that the identification of Samaris as the Queen of Heaven is one of those that will come up again in the Book of Revelations. Um, uh, he is one of the only ones that says, okay, she was both mother and wife, and I'm going with, mo- uh, with wife as opposed to mother. But the thing that stands out there is this mother-son cult that we have, or mother and child cult that we have, um, that has come through into uh, current religions. And it's this kind of deification that's given to Samaritans that follows through. But that will lead us very quickly to the death and the demise of Nimrod. But these are figures uh, that, uh, when I say figures, these are personalities that have emerged through the ages. She has in, indeed influenced various cultures and religious traditions. And it's important that we understand where we are. But we need to go back for Samaria because her whole thing is a pagan type religion. She's a sun worshiper. She was. Uh, Edgar de Gas is one of those who has written extensively about her, the relationship between Nimrod and Samaria. And it, it is intriguing to say the least. Uh, even her birth is, um, semi divine kind of situation. Uh, her mom was a demigod when she was born. Her mom had an affair with a human and because of it, she was shamed and she did not take care of the baby. She actually put the baby out, you know, so they in the desert. And uh, according to legend, she was raised by doves and found by shepherds. Mama went back into the ocean, um, because we're talking a fish god here, and she turned herself into a fish. But it, it goes, you know, we're talking legend here, but as a person who walked, who walked there, Samaritans, um, did have military exploits, depending on what culture you're reading. Um, and, and she was, um, a mom, uh, because she and Nimrod supposedly had children. If we take a look at, uh, Ezekiel 8, chapter 14, verse, we'll see where she, we're talking about her son and the pagan rituals that, uh, were undertaken. But there's problems with this theory, especially the whole book that his wrote, uh, calling the two Babylons, um, it's very critical. It seems to, to be making its one point. And the Bible does not mention uh, these kinds of relationships. But taking a look at Jeremiah 44 and 19, um, we, we have a mention of the Queen of Heaven. And it refers to a pagan goddess people were worshiping. And there's no evidence specifically that Samaria is that goddess. But according to history, she was the Queen of Heaven. And she was married to Nimrod. Now, Nimrod's death, we were getting to that. Uh, his his death um, is like three or four different versions thereof. Uh, and it's a mystery who surrounds it. And it does that because the Bible does not provide explicit details regarding the death of Nimrod. Because that lack of information exists, guess what? We have legends that have grown up around in his death. And this will give us an opportunity to link Nimrod to Abraham as we go through. But then there are those scholars who say it couldn't have existed because Nimrod and Abraham are separated by years. You know, if we're looking at that time, timeline, we're looking at, you know, the table of nations given in the book of Genesis and we go on. Now, the ambiguity surrounding Nimrod's death leaves room for interpretation and debate because there's one hypothesis that Shem um, or Esau killed him uh, uh, because of, uh, you know, they were fighting. 
And there's another legend that says a tiny night gnat or mosquito brought down this mighty ruler about flying into his brain and driving him mad. Shem would have done, if we go with that explanation, he would have killed Nimrod in a public battle um, because of that. And Esau would have killed him because of his uh, turning his back on God and falling into the sun worship kind of thing that was going on. Now, his death remains elusive. Like I said, it gets confusing. But here we still have this story of a black man. And you're going to say, well, how could that add to his legacy? We'll see in just a moment. The ancient history that we have here suggests that one one thing for sure, he died a violent death um, because of his conflicts or his political rivalries. Uh, But he was given an influential role during his time. And there are many speculations that engage here. We have him as an enigmatic figure in history. He is controversial. He automatically draws questions when you mention his name. Um, He is, his marriage is surrounded in mystery and myth, and myth. For Christians, it's important that we seek truth and wisdom in the light of God's word. In this pursuit, the teachings and the examples of Jesus Christ are the central things for us, you know, because they provide guidance and a framework of understanding for us in any biblical narrative, including the story of Nimrod. You know, when he turned from God, and one of the interesting things about turning from God and one of the uh, theories there is that he was, uh, we're not talking too many years past the flood because he. This is all tied into the building of the Tower of Babel, you know, that, you know, God would never bring that kind of water. One of the reasons they wanted to go so high is because God could not bring that kind of water again as it had wiped out his forefathers. And um, and, and all the people who were there with him in this community um, had persons who were, you know, they were like basically first, second generation had been destroyed by the flood. So the story of Nimrod and Samaria, whether it's fact or fiction, is not based on scripture. Nimrod is. Um, they may be intriguing possibilities to ponder, but uh, they only go so far. We do know, and for the purpose of this discussion, that he was a Hamite. He was a black man, as we go through here. And we just have to go through and say to ourselves, okay, this is not, we, we can read it because we have the, all kinds of lessons in it. Is that, you know, we don't want to connect ourselves to false worship. And this is where we get that uh, conflict because one, one version of Nimrod's life is that he had this dream, which is so great, you know, because we see this dream motif over and over in, in these stories of these characters. And this is prior to the birth of Abraham. And he sees this, and he realizes the um, his interpretation is that Abraham will, even though he's going to be born, he's going to destroy him. His purpose of coming is the destruction of Nimrod. So he sets out to to eliminate this by having um, Abraham's father supposedly bring him the child. And you know that was basically just to kill, you know, to kill, um, to kill him. But it it, it uh, it's one of those things that you just have to say, okay, all right, we're going to go with this and, and let it be. Um, and the story of Samaritan, just getting into her part of the life is just amazing. Uh, but she is not mentioned in the Bible. And although I write about her extensively, I don't particularly want to put a lot of emphasis on her right now. Now, you say, okay, what's his legacy? You've already told, told us why it's important to know about her or to study her. But what's the legacy of Nimrod? Well, as a mom watching uh, comics with my son, I remember hearing, uh, you know, we're talking about Bugs Bunny here. You know, said so that's where you're going too far. But Bugs Bunny um, and Elmer Flood, I mean, we all know that story. Uh, Bugs Bunny refers to 
uh, Emma Flood as a hunter. But that's being done in a tongue-in-cheek way because we're talking about a cartoon. And it's, it's not being said in the sense that Emma Flood was, what, a mighty hunter? No. In fact, if you remember the cartoon, it's just the opposite. He was not a mighty hunter. You know, he was not a mighty hunter. He was inept in most cases. So he's referred to as a Nimrod. So even though I, at the time I was watching, I didn't make the, it went over my head as we were saying when we were younger. I did not make that connection. I do now understand. And it is part of the American vernacular to say that person is a Nimrod, meaning that he, he, he's, he's not that hunter. He is not that hunter that Nimrod was. Then you're basically sort of taking a tongue and cheek approach. Now, what other kind of legacy does Nimrod have? Well, believe it or not, if we were to take a look at some of the Marvel comic books, there are quite a few of them. The X-Men series, particularly, um, we would find Nimrod right there. I mean, he is heavily into uh, the comics. And if you have some of the earlier editions, you actually are holding on to some wealth in your hands. Uh, he is known as Nimrod in, in many of them. Um, and he is depicted as a hero. Um, and there is absolutely no doubt, in fact, the creator of the comic will tell you that Nimrod was named after the biblical character, you know, who's depicted in the Bible. And he's depicted as a great hunter. Well, here he is the comic book hero. And, uh, it's part of the X-Men series. Uh, it, 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 in fact, there are quite a, quite a few, um, books wherein he is located. Um, he has 31 appearances in Nimrod, as Nimrod in Earth 616. He has minor, six appearances that are minor as a minor character. Um, he goes through the whole thing, um, where he, he dies and he's given the opportunity to come back and to do some other things. Uh, it, we could talk for hours just about the way that Nimrod, uh, is depicted in, especially 616 and Earth 811. Those are, um, two that are, uh, are very popular. Okay. Well, so how else could I get my kid interested in Nimrod? Well, believe it or not, there are video games, Christian video games, um, uh, of which he is a, a part of. He is the, the central character in many of them. Um, the hero, as it were. Um, he's also uh, depicted sometimes not as Nimrod, but as Dimrod. They turned the spelling of his name around, and this character is not as good as, quote-unquote, Nimrod. As we go through this and we work on it, we have to remember that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, this is uh, one of the points we want to remember. In Genesis, he's seen as what? A mighty hunter. Now, what happened according to the legends where he turns his back on God and creates this sun wish of a deity, uh, we need to know because it's a warning against things that could happen to us. He was a mighty hunter, and he did found found as the founder of ancient Mesopotamian cities. Those are the things that um, these these cities became uh, city states and kingdoms in their own right. And he was a, a military strategist who had to defend them. And then as a person who had to revolt against God, we have to remember those things as we go on. He had at one time, he had a, uh, a reputation of being good. And that's a lesson to us. We can be good, but we can also turn to be bad. It's a, it's a theme that's found over and over in our, in our biblical stories. He was a descendant of Ham, Noah's son. And it, it traces all the way back. And it is part of the biblical genealogy that we have to stand on. It provides a context for his culture and his religious significance. 
grounding these legendary exploits into larger um, things as they, as they go on. Now, whether he was the architect or he was pivotal in the building of the Tower of Babel, it's there. And the Tower of Babel is used in a Christian point of view to explain the different languages that we have and that we use today. And the tower itself was a symbol of defiance. It was a, it was a symbol. It represented the embodiment of human pride, arrogance, and defiance against the natural order that was already established by the divine. You can't put yourself above God. You can't do that. It's not one of those things you should do. He became a permanent figure in Hebrew full grown. Therefore, he comes over to us. His story appears, as said earlier, in the book of Genesis. Um, his legacy extends to various cultures worldwide. He is one of those uh, figures that we mentioned earlier who just crosses the board as far as uh, any type of religion that you think of. He presents a, a global narrative that underscores the universality of his story and the resonance across the diverse societies and that's lasted for years. He represents the epitome of rebellion against God. He symbolizes that more so than what any of the others that we will talk about in the future who have uh, defied God and tried to do things that shouldn't have been done. His narrative influences Judeo-Christian theology. We are both grateful to it, and we have to remember from time to time um, those those traits that we should not have. His character embodies themes and powers of rebellion, not only against God, but against his relatives and against any of those who stood against his authority. His authority, not God's, but his. And we didn't get into Samarius a lot, but it is when Nimrod died that she proclaimed herself this god, goddess. And she said Nimrod died and he went to the sky as a star. And on December 25th, he comes back. He is reincarnated. First, the baby that she was carrying at the time was a son. But Nimrod reincarnates himself. Every year, as an evergreen Christmas tree, and he well, an evergreen tree that has presents underneath. Um, that's part of the myth that goes along with that. Some of the other things that we have to remember as we go through Nimrod is that it's a good way to look at history, uh, even though you have to be able to detect the mythology and the legends out of it, because there's been no statues per se or writing on scrolls or walls or anything uh, not in the Christian part of the world at that point but according to those scholars and archaeologists who are studying Mesopotamia and Babylon um, there are traces that are being found now that are associated with Nimrod's story and they reflect the cultural and religious dynamics of, the, of that particular time. Now, as we go through and we come to a close of our study, which is really not the end, there's just so much to be said for Nimrod. We have to remember, it's a good story for children to be told, not so much from the point of view of the mother-wife situation at all, but from the point of view of being good and accepted and then turning to be something that one should not be. Um, don't forget for those who collect Marvel Comics, uh, he first appeared in The Uncanny X-Men, X -Men, which was number 191. And um, he goes on, for those children who are interested or adults who are interested, it's a good way to pick up your Bible and and read some of the other things that go along with him. Now, if we want to go today and take a look at recent scholarship, which is what we're going to do before we run out of time, 
we want to take a look at the fact that um, there's a lot of interest right now in artificial intelligence. So one of the things we want to take a look at is uh, how we as Christians should be approaching the uh, the situation with AI. Um, yeah, we have no problem talking about it in terms of some things, but when we we want to look at some video games for for children or uh, for adults who play, I, I don't know why I want to say children are the only ones who are gamers. But there are some games out there that um, that are video games for children. There are um, there are like sixteen of the top ones, but there's one in particular that's sort of related to where we are today, and it has to do with Nimrod. And I'm trying to think of the name of it as we go through, and I'm having trouble finding it. But um, video oh is Nimcom R3, and it plays on a Windows platform. And God has chosen two game characters to be uh, hunters of a uh, daemon, and it's the man and a wife who has the ability to touch any weapon. And once they touch the weapon, it becomes a deadly weapon. But there are so many games out there. And those, uh, there are so many that are associated with Nimrod. And as we go through, um, games for our little ones, there's a whole, a maker who, uh, who has games that start out as called light, light users. And these are games of the virtual world that are grounded in Christian faith. And they are games that can be played. With family in, intact, you know, you want them to be played with the family. Light gliders. It allows the kids to engage in the digital world while teaching them bigger, better, and more positive Christ-like lessons. And these are lessons that are likely to remember because they are interactive. And it's something that's quite good for, for everyone. Now, in the area of news today, we will Take a look very quickly at how we should be reacting to AI. The one thing that we need to remember, more than anything else, is that AI is not something that's meant to replace humans. It's not that at all. It is something, before we make up our minds as to how we want to deal with it, it's something that will make us question how human we are in our interactions with others. If you will, Join me next week for podcast three, and we will do our very best to get to Abraham and Hagar. I, I, I truly thank you for joining me today, and I hope that you have enjoyed the podcast. Um, and I, I look forward to sharing with you. Just remember, black history is Bible history. Thank you. From the Files of Dr. Mack, hosted by J.J. 